Okay, right. Well, I don't know where to start with uh, introducing Greg, uh, other than the fact that uh, I've known him for 10 years. I went over to uh, do a lecture at an Edgar Casey Foundation Ancient Mysteries Conference, I think in 2001 or two. And uh, he met me from the airport with his lovely wife, Laura. And we're, after the conference, we explored over the whole of um, Ohio, West Virginia, and realised that we had uh, incredible things in common, you know, not just to do with ancient mysteries, but also UFOs and a keen passion for uh, the work of John Keel. Um, and we went to um, Point Pleasant, West Virginia, um, where the whole Mothman uh, episode supposedly took place during the 1960s, as was covered by John Keel. And we realised that, you know, we had a great, bond of friendship there and uh you know that's something that has uh so far produced two uh, incredible books together um denis of an origins which came out i think in 2019 and the new book called origins of the gods uh which we'll mention greg will certainly be mentioning um but uh uh jim was talking about uh greg's uh mound encyclopedia i just want to show you what it is in size at the moment. I mean, a Graham Hancock, when he was doing America before, actually told me he had Greg's book in his backpack, uh, you know, locating any of the mound sites that he wanted to go to. So uh, that, I think, is a perfect question. So if you haven't got it on your bookshelf, get it now, because once it's revived, it's going to be double the thickness. So... In other words, I would, I would get the version now as opposed to what's to come because that might not even fit in your backpack. Um, but anyway, uh, so without further ado, I uh, will introduce my good friend, Dr. Greg Little, um, and uh, what he has to tell us. So uh, take it away, Greg. It's an honor to speak at the Origins Conference. Uh, I think this is the third time that I've done it. It's one of the longest running conferences around. And thank you. Uh, to all the people that have supported it. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, I want to thank Hugh, and I want to thank Andrew Collins for the invitation, uh, and also thank uh, anyone else that's involved with the conference. Uh, thanks to all the viewers. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. So today I want to focus on one very specific ancient mystery. I'm not going to go all over the place. I'm going to focus in on American Indian mounds and one particular issue involved with them. Uh, that mystery reveals why some of America's ancient mounds were arranged in the way that they were. They created sight lines that pointed to the rising and setting of specific stars on the horizon at certain times of the year. We all know that the solstices and the equinoxes were definitely important times for certain rituals, but there's a lot more to it, and we are really starting to learn why they did what they did. Now, in America, we don't generally use the term barrows. Um, we use terms mounds, moats, and earthworks. Earthworks are earthen embankments that are sometimes linear. There are squares. There are circles. Uh, sometimes they're very odd shapes that are impossible to really describe. Uh, America also had flat top pyramids, which are called truncated mounds, uh, and lots of burial mounds. Uh, the burial mounds, which are conical cone-shaped mounds, uh, often had stone burial chambers in them, basically identical to the stone tombs and chambers found in the UK and throughout Europe. So let's just dive into this. And so I'm going to start up my uh, PowerPoint here and share my screen. Let's try to reveal some of the mysteries. Uh, the Path of Souls is something that's made this uh, possible now. And the Path of Souls is a ritual. It's a death ritual. It was uncovered around the year 2000 or so. And when I say uncovered, it was really understood and explained then. Uh, around the year 2000, started in the 1990s investigating it. Now we know. So America's mound builders really are dated to about 4500 BC. 
were 6,500 years ago. And they were active till about the year 1600, when more and more explorers and settlers moved into America. South America has mounds dated to as old as 8,400 BC, over 10,000 years ago. Chances are there are many mounds older than that in South America, but there just hasn't been as much archaeology done there as in the United States. And it's it's probably true that in America, there are, North America, there are mounds older than 4,500 BC too. They're probably underwater, but that's another story. We know that these mound builders probably made over a million mounds in North America. Most of those have been destroyed. Uh, there are probably 100,000 left. May, many of the mounds were in what are called mound complexes. A complex is a grouping of mounds that could have somewhere between four to maybe 120 or so mounds at a single site. And there are some mound sites that have a hundred mounds and then maybe a mile away is another mound site that has a hundred mounds and another one. There are lots of these. There are dozens and dozens of these widespread sites with hundreds of mounds. So in 1881, the Smithsonian created what they called the division of mound exploration, and it was part of what was then called the Bureau of Ethnology. Later, it became the Bureau of American Ethnology. Uh, from 1882 to 90, they sent out three field agents to excavate mounds. I found it really interesting that they paid them $125 a month, which had to cover their expenses, including what it cost them to hire people at the sites to do the digging. During that project, about an eight-year project, they identified 100,000 mound sites. The exact number is not known. They simply estimated it at 100,000 sites. They came up with this map. This map. This was published in one of the early Bureau of Ethnology books. Uh, the red dots on this map represent sites, complexes, not individual mounds. Now, I'm going to move my pointer around here a bit. And I wish it was a bit larger, but this is the best I can do. You can see uh, this is actually the Mississippi River going north, and you can see mounds are all along it. And then you look at all the tributaries. Here's the Ohio River. You can see mounds there. Well, obviously, they built a lot of mounds around the rivers, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, obviously, water is a good place to live near. Uh, and it's good to keep you alive, but also it's a means of travel. And that explains why they identified so many of them along the rivers. And that's because the Smithsonian's field agents used the rivers for travel. They did do some travel by railroad, but most of it was on the rivers. If, if we go in now and added the mounds that we know about now, a couple hundred years later, uh, this would be almost solid red. I want to add one more thing here. I'm not going to claim that the mounds were built by anyone other than the ancestors of the current Native American tribes. I just want to add that, but it doesn't really explain anything. Most people, when they think of mounds, they think of these small conical burial mounds. Uh, there were clearly probably a million of those if you know um, history, you'll know that there were somewhere around 60 million people living in the Americas when Columbus came in 1492, 60 million people. So obviously uh, they had ancestors who were buried. So a million burial mounds is not really that many for a population of that, bi that big. I will add this, this one's in, uh, Alabama, it's at Russell Cave National Monument. Russell Cave goes back to about 10,000 BC. Uh, it is no longer marked. There are three burial mounds here at this site, but they're no longer marked and there's no paths leading to them because they're afraid that people will loot them. But that's what most people think of. However, burial mounds get much, much bigger. This is one in Batesville, Mississippi. And I'm just gonna run through a bunch of these so you can get kind of a visual orientation to what they look like. This is a very large burial mound in South Charleston, West Virginia. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk a great deal about giants here. Uh, I've got maybe 50 minutes here left that I'm going to talk. But from this particular mound, it was thoroughly excavated by the Smithsonian in the late 1800s. They pulled a seven foot, eight inch giant out of this. And in the, the giant was buried with uh, 11 other skeletons that were arranged in a circle around it like wheel spokes. That is the giant laid in the center and then all the others came out of it like spokes on a wheel, which has been found at a lot of other sites. No one knows exactly what that means. This is another mound close to it, uh, a burial mound known as the Poor House Mound, the Shawnee Mound, the Institute Mound, the Reservation Mound. Uh, it's in South Charleston, West Virginia. It is called Shawnee and Institute and Reservation Mound because this for a while was an Indian reservation. And then it became a mental institute. That's how it got the name Institute. It's now 20 feet high. Uh, before it was excavated, it was 26 feet high, had two seven foot skeletons pulled out of it. Uh, it was shown on a couple of ancient aliens episodes also. Here is an unexcavated mound not too far from it in West Virginia, known as the Reynolds Mound. I want to mention and explain why you will see a person uh, in most of these. And that is you've got to have a person in the picture so you can get an idea of the size of the mound. Uh, it, they really help. There are lots of mounds uh, found throughout Ohio, Tennessee, many, many other states that are in cemeteries now. The early settlers often use these burial mounds for their burials, and they produce cemeteries around them because the mounds were usually in high ground, and they didn't flood. So you'll find a lot of these. You just drive around in America and look for them, and you'll see them. And then there are stone mounds. These are... Pretty interesting. This is the largest one in Alabama. And it's odd because it's a reconstruction using the exact same stones from the original mound. The original mound was found in a on the top of a mountain near a Sam's and Walmart near Alice Aniston, Alabama. And for reasons that I don't entirely understand, they deconstructed the stone mound on the top of the mountain. And they took all the stones down to the bottom to a newly built park and reconstructed the stone mound in the park. Uh, I don't really understand it. It made national news. It, it was a really big deal. But this is actually a very gigantic stone mound. And the archaeologist involved in this uh, was then involved in the discovery of thousands of more stone mounds in Alabama in the 2000s. We're talking about just the last 20 years, thousands of more mounds discovered in this one area in Alabama. And there are reasons why they were unknown. For example, a lot of them are on mountains near Fort McClellan, Alabama, which is also near Anniston. Uh, it was off limits. It was a military reservation. And this is an example. This is one that was looted. You can tell that it was looted. Uh, there are about 60 mounds right here in this one little area, but there are literally thousands of these in the immediate area. Back to some large burial mounds. This is the Miami's Bird Mound. These are called Adena era mounds. Adena started around 1000 to 2000 BC. Uh, they had very elaborate stone tombs in the base of the mound. This one's 68 feet tall. The Adena also sometimes covered mounds with stones, and this one was covered in stone slabs. Here is an aerial, well, I say that. <sighs> This is the aerial shot of the Miami's Bird Mound. There are still some stone slabs here, but they're now about two feet underground. The original stone slabs were taken by the early settlers and used for building construction. That happened all over America. This is a, another very, very large burial mound, Grave Creek in Moundsville, West Virginia. It's 69 feet tall, and it was encircled by a deep, moat 
And right in the immediate area, in roughly a quarter mile around it, there were over a hundred mounds and earthworks there. We're getting into the Hopewell era mounds now. Hopewell built the burial mounds, but they also built effigy mounds and they started a lot of earthworks. These are the Dunleaf Mounds in Gramercy Park in East Dubuque, Illinois. The Mississippi River is right on the other side of that flag, not too far from it. There were 26 mounds here. They're all still there. And there were seven, several seven foot skeletons recovered out of this mound by the Smithsonian. And on the back side of those mounds are displays that show the illustrations from the Smithsonian showing the seven foot skeletons. Conus Mound in Marietta, Ohio. Uh, and it's called the Conus Mound because it really does look like a cone. There was a huge moat surrounding it. And here is the survey of the site. I hope you can see my pointer. I've put it right in the center. Uh, I'm moving it over to the right a bit. This is the Conus Mound I just showed you. Around it was a moat. And then there were these linear earthworks that connected to a square. At the points of the square and openings were mounds. And then it led to another almost square shape that had flat top mounds on the inside of it. And that then oriented to what is called a graded way that went down to the Muskingum River. On the other side of the river is a high bluff and there were four very, very large stone mounds at the top of the bluff, creating a sight line that we now know was used to trace the moon and the moon's movements. There are also further down here, you'll see three more stone mounds that were used as sight lines. And I won't get into all that now, but this is an amazingly large site. I mean, it's huge. There are houses all over up and down these streets now. Many of these mounds still remain. Some of the earthworks still remain. It's a fascinating place. We're getting into platform mounds now and truncated mounds. This is in Pinson, Tennessee. This is called Saul's Mound after the original discoverer or landowner. It's 72 feet tall, very, very large, built in 100 BC. And again, just for perspective and size, there are people standing here. Uh, around a sign. This really gives you an idea of how massive that mound really is. And there is in the base of it an unexcavated huge stone tomb. This is another platform mound at the Pinson site. It's called Ozier's Mound. It's 23 feet tall. They know this was built roughly around the year 200 BC. And on the top of it, there was a temple or a chief's residence. Looks up, uh, don't have it there. Um, these were very large structures used for really for rituals and for people living on them that had elite status in the society. To really explain how incredible and bizarre some of these mound sites were, the Emerald Mound in Mississippi, it's on the Natchez Trace. It's still there. You can still visit it. You can walk on it. Uh, it's an amazing site. It had eight mounds built on top of a gigantic base mound. The huge base mound covers eight acres, eight acres. It, the length is 770 feet. It's 435 feet wide. And this base mound is 30 feet, 35 feet tall. The temple mound, the tall one here, is 60 feet by 130 feet and 30 feet high. All this still exists. This is a reconstruction of it. The temple mound here I want to show you, that is it. That is what's on top of the huge base mound. Uh, the smaller mound at the other end is still there. So when you go back and look at this, you think about, well, why did they do this? Why is it built this way? And it's for alignments to where a priest could stand and at the openings of his temple on one of these mounds and look across this mound, across another temple and see some significant astronomical alignment. Winterville Mounds in Mississippi. This is a massive central mound, 23 mounds here. 
The central mound is 55 feet high. That is it. There's a person standing at the base of the mound. Uh, Andrew Collins went uh, here with us back in around 2004, said it was the hottest day of his life. I think it was 104 degrees when we were there, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is the humidity is just unbearable. Uh, go to the north in Wisconsin. This is the Aztalan Temple Mound. It is a huge complex of over 100 mounds still there. Um, there's just so many of them. And I've written and still believe that America's mound, mounds are one of the most unappreciated archaeological wonders of the world. In Georgia, you have these pristine mounds. This is the smallest of the Etowah, Georgia mounds. And this snapshot is taken from the tallest of the three mounds that are there, the three flat top mounds. But they give you a pretty good idea of what they look like in ancient times. One more I want to show you here. It's a massive mound in Florence, Alabama, 43 feet high. Uh, it is a gigantic platform mound. There are smaller ones. This is the Owl Creek site in Mississippi. There are three mounds there. That's Andrew Collins and myself who were there a few years ago. That's Andrew at the top of the Temple Mound at Owl Creek. And then we have Cahokia, sort of the, the, the big granddaddy of it all. This is a reconstruction of the Cahokia site by Herb Rowe, who is one of the uh, most respected of the archaeological reconstruction artists. Uh, this is a, licensed from him. It's also found in my mound encyclopedia. Hopefully, again, you can see my pointer here. Uh, there's 120 mounds at the site, and there's 80 some in the in the park today because this is now a, a massive park area. This large mound is called Monk's Mound because a uh, when the first settlers came in, a Franciscan monk put a hut at the top of the mound and lived there. It had a huge wall, roughly 50 feet high around it in approximately uh, A.D. 1200. The central mound here is 100 feet tall. Uh, its base is larger than the Great Pyramid at Giza. And then you can see there's all these other mounds. There is a wood hinge, if you follow my pointer, all the way down to the lower left side. And at this wood hinge, we know that astro astronomical alignments to stars were being made. There is a central pole there. And from that central pole, other poles were used to make the alignments. And the population is somewhat unknown, but somewhere between 25,000 to 50,000 people lived here. So let's take a look at this mound, Monk's Mound for a moment. That is Monk's Mound in Cahokia, uh, 100 feet tall. The base covers 14 acres. And you can see downtown St. Louis from the top of this mound. To give you an idea of its size, back in 1987, over 5,000 people gathered on the top of Monk's Mound. And of course, uh, everyone knows about the effigy mounds. This is Serpent Mound in Ohio. There were literally thousands of effigy mounds in the United States made in the shape of birds and snakes and bears, all kinds of animals, and even human forms. There were 10,000 of these in one little area of Iowa along the Mississippi River alone, 10,000 in one place alone. This is a shot of Serpent Mound, as you can see it from the observation tower. It's a very impressive site, but again, it's just one of thousands of effigy mounds in the United States. And last, I want to talk about earthworks before we get into the actual alignments here and how we did this. Uh, earthworks, they're made out of dirt, obviously, that is carefully arranged. Uh, this is in Portsmouth, Ohio, and, and portions of this are in a park in Portsmouth, Ohio. You can see there's a horseshoe-shaped earthwork. One of these still exists today, and I'll show you a photo of it later. Uh, very complex, though. I don't even know how to describe this. 
they they built these walkways. You can see this is a pathway. The outside of the pathway here had two linear walls of earth enclosing the flat pathway. The pathway is 160 feet wide. The walls of earth here are 40 feet wide. And in this particular view, it runs five miles, hits the Ohio River, picks up on the other side of the Ohio River and runs to an earthwork. So why? And hopefully we're going to explain why. Lots of other bizarre earthworks around the United States. This is one in Florida called Big City Mound. This curved shape sea mound. This is a huge mound that has mounds built on top of it. It is 15 acres in size and it's 23 feet in height. But then it then attaches to all these other mounds, flat top mounds. And again, still exists. I love this one, Big Tony Circles Mound, Circle Mound in Clewiston, Florida. Clewiston is down near, um, well, it's in Southern Florida, not too far from uh, Miami and Lake Okeechobee. Uh, it covers 16 acres. There's 15 mounds here. I, I don't even know how to describe this. Uh, these are elevated walkways <laughs> leading to the flat top mounds. Um, I don't know how to describe it, but portion of this still exists. The Terracea Mounds near St. Petersburg, you can visit these, uh, still exist today. This large mound here, which covered 10 acres, it's 20 feet high. It's thought to be have been about 40 feet high when it was in use. I love this one up here because I live in Memphis, and this looks like a guitar, uh, and I like to pretend that it was Elvis's guitar, but again, still exists. Very strange. Another one in Florida called the Shields Mound. It's near Jacksonville, Florida. This platform mound uh, toward the bottom is 215 feet square. It's 18 feet high. And then there's these long earthworks that extend to a circular earthwork, closed circular earthwork. Uh, and you can see that the it actually declines down in a way for you to uh, walk to the bottom or walk to the top. It is two, it, it's a mile long. Both of these are a mile long. And this one oddly looks like a fish hook. Again, it's almost indescribable, hard to explain. And then the one that's the hardest to explain, Poverty Point, Louisiana, which is a specific site, but Poverty Point is today known to be a culture. And there are at least 50 known Poverty Point sites. Virtually all of them are in Louisiana and Mississippi. The origin's unknown, although almost everybody now believes it came from Mexico. Uh, started around circa 2500 BC. Some portions of this go back to 3800 BC. Uh, there's a huge bird effigy mound that dominates the site up here in the uh, upper right-hand side. It is a gigantic bird effigy mound where a bird is laying on its back. It is still there. Portions of the bird effigy mound have been dated to roughly 3800 BC, while other portions are dated to 1800 BC. Nobody really knows when this thing was built. There were aligned pathways and walkways through the site. And it had these embankments, a series of embankments. The embankments are terraces that are six feet high. They are exactly all 80 feet, high, 80 feet wide. So six feet high, 80 feet wide, and 150 feet apart. There is enough earth in them to fill the Great Pyramid 30 times. They built a wood hinge in the center for alignments. And we know that in these pathways that cut through it, they had these large posts stuck in the ground. Again, it's very en enigmatic. Um, I wouldn't even want to try and go further in describing it. It's, it, but it's there. It's a great place to go to and see. The Mississippian era mounds uh, became one of my real most interesting ones 
because we know they were doing the path of souls ritual. And so we decided to look at the alignments. This is an archeological reconstruction of one in Bottle Creek, Alabama. And it, it's a pretty accurate reconstruction. So the question is, why did they build this the way they did? Large mounds in the center, lots around the outer edges and some that are outside of the main site. So I just wanted to show you this reconstruction. I really like it because it's pretty accurate. This is another reconstruction from Troyville, Louisiana. Almost all of it's destroyed. The main mound was originally 82 feet high and it had a 60 foot tall structure on the top. There were 13 mounds here. It was enclosed by a wall and a palisade, um, had a moat around it. Uh, again, there, there were alignments there and we'll try and get to those in a minute. But some of these sites such as this one would have simply too many alignments. This is at Lake George in Holly Bluff, Mississippi. Uh, I've been here. The large mound uh, that's in the center has a mobile home sitting on top of it now. Lots of the other mounds have been uh, destroyed from farming, but there's a few that are there. But the problem with this site would be no matter where you were at it, you got too many alignments. So it depends. What are you going to look at? What star are you going to zero in on? And what time of the year? There's just too much there. Too much here at the original Hopewell site, too. It was originally, uh, when it was originally excavated, they thought that in this center portion, that this may represent the Pleiades because there are seven mounds in it. And what it is is an enclosure inside of an enclosure. The enclosure is a wall of earth with a ditch or moat on the exterior, but there are, as you can see, many openings or gateways into it. And then there are mounds all over the place. And there's a square that you would enter from. Again, it's almost too much. There's too many possible things to look at here. This one is one we're gonna try on that uh, actually explained almost everything to archeologists back in the 1980s because it was un inexplicable to them until a couple of non-archaeologists figured out what in the world was uh, happening here. This is in Newark, Ohio. It was built roughly in 500 BC. A lot of it still exists today. The distance from what is known as the circle and octagon, which is on the left, to this circle down here is right at a mile or nine tenths of a mile between them. So we're talking about a very, very large area here. This circle is a wall of earth making a perfect circle enclosing 20 acres. Then there are linear lines of earth creating an octagon. The walls of earth are about nine feet high. At each of the connection points in this octagon, there are platform mounds. And then on the outside, there are these long linear lines of earth, parallel lines of earth enclosing walkways, which run over a mile. They go in this case to a square, which leads to this circle. So let's go back and take just a minute and take a look at the circle and octagon. You see in red here, it says observatory mound, and that is this little area right here. So if we, come on, it's going very slow. That is the observatory mound at Newark. The observatory mound itself is 14 feet high. And it was figured out in the early 1980s by two college professors, Hively and Horn were their names. And what they did back before computers uh, and back before we had all these easy ways to calculate the movements of the sun and the stars and the moon, but they calculated that it, it was a permanent way uh, to predict the eclipses. That is, that it was this gigantic earthen observatory that would predict the moon's movements over 18.61 years. And as you can see here, if you'd stand at 
the at the bottom here, you'd stand at the observatory on the observatory mound and look through the very center of it all out the opening, and you would see the maximum northern moonrise from that particular spot. Now, I don't want to go through all this because we're not really focused on the moon, but this is where it really started in American archaeology, the very first one that was accepted. These are some pictures. Um, yeah, went too far. This is going pretty slow here. Just click. Okay. This is the circle. Let me go back. There we go. Uh, see the small circle here? I want to show you what it really looks like. It is this. There is the circle. This is the opening. It is pretty large. These are the connection lines, the wall, linear walls of Earth. Uh, over here to the far right-hand side is one of the platform mounds. These are the walls of the octagon moving out to the center left. You can see more walls of the octagon. Very, very large. Uh, I want to look at the great circle a minute. Just keep moving. It is identical in size and basic form to Avebury in the UK. The difference is we have a huge eagle mound right in the center, a mound in the shape of an eagle. And of course, we don't have the standing stones, but it's the same size. This is a photograph from the 1930s from the Ohio Historical Society. And you can see outer an outer embankment of earth. Uh, it's about nine feet tall, the walls of earth. And then there's a moat on the outside that's about seven feet tall. This is a shot of the moat on the inside, and this is part of the circle, the outer circle. Going to start moving a little faster here. Uh, this is the Ohio Historical Society's illustration of the circle and octagon being used as an eclipse predictor. That's not mine. That is official from them. This is an illustration that I had done showing a night ceremony that might have taken place at the Circle and Octagon. So let's get into archaeoastronomy in America and what Andrew and I actually did. So in the 1980s, archaeologists at the University of Arkansas were very interested in possible stellar alignments at many mound complexes that I've already shown you here in the southern United States. So they zeroed in on 33 sites. Their main focus was what are called the Toltec Mounds near Little Rock, Arkansas. And what their analysis showed is virtually all these mound sites had sight lines from one mound across the top of the other mound to the setting of stars, uh, particularly the sunrise and sunset of the winter and summer solstices. That is what virtually all of these sites showed. All of them zeroed in on the summer solstice and the winter solstice. But they also found a few other star alignments, but they had a problem. They literally said in their publication, we don't know what time frame to look for other than the solstices and the equinoxes. So what day of the year are you going to look at? Because the star movement changes through the year. And we don't even know what stars that really matter to the ancient people, what constellations really matter. They knew, for example, uh, that the brightest stars like Sirius would be important and maybe the North Star. But other than that, they really didn't know. So back in the early 80s, they were stuck with the solstices and the equinoxes. And that was about it. Here is an example of what it looks like at the Toltec Mounds. Uh, and you can really see here, if you were standing here at night and there was a temple on the top of one of these mounds, you can imagine pretty easily a star coming down, sitting in the top of it, or the sun for that matter, sitting right in the top of it. This is another shot of the mounds at Toltec, uh, still another. They're actually pretty large. And that leads us to the Path of Souls ritual and uh, what we worked on. The path of souls has pretty much changed everything in American archaeoastronomy. It was a first identified in the early 2000s. There was this large team of anthropologists and 
uh, archaeologists and ethnographers who worked at Texas State University. And basically, they found it by going through the old books that the Smithsonian published, as well as uh, some of the early publications by ethnographers and some of the Spanish friars. The path of souls always takes place around the winter solstice. That's the timing. Remember, I said that the astronomers didn't really know uh, exactly what time of year to look for. So we're looking at the winter solstice, Gen generally December 21st with uh, plus or minus three weeks is what they found. Uh, the specific alignments we're looking at, the sunrise and sunset on the winter solstice, we believe that should be shown at a site. The sighting of Orion's nebula on the east, that is at night when you first see Orion's nebula, there is almost always something that points to it. And then the setting of Cygnus or the star Deneb to the northwest, that is always there. And the setting of Orion's nebula on the western horizon. So they would view the setting sun on the winter solstice sunset. They would enter an enclosure or the site and then they would see Orion rising on the east. That was the, that was the real beginning of it. Orion is the first destination on a multi-destination flight here. They would then watch the setting of Deneb or Cygnus in the northwest, probably light the cremation fires. And then later at night, right before dawn, they would watch Orion fall into the western horizon and that sent a soul to the sky. And that is what the path of souls ritual is all about. And we know that Orion is important and we know that Cygnus is important. Those are the two major stellar alignments that we got to look for. Here is a artist depiction of what it probably would have looked like. You see the setting of the sun, there is an opening there. Uh, the priest or shaman is at the bottom leading a ritual. There are cremation fires. The rituals themselves had a lot of singing, dancing, drumming, whistling, and hallucinogenics. Uh, in a new book that Andrew and I have done uh, called Origins of the Gods, we describe all this a little better, but we really didn't get into the rituals and how they worked. Uh, and maybe in our next book, uh, in the future, sometime, we'll really explain some of these rituals. But I, I really like this illustration. Here's another illustration of what uh, Orion might have looked like in the night sky to them. To the mound builders, Orion was a severed hand. And Orion had an, an ogi or a slit in its palm. The slit or the ogi is Orion's nebula. And the three belt stars of Orion represented the severed wrist of it. There is a legend about it. I don't have time to get into the legend, but that is what it may have looked like to him. Again, an artist's uh, illustration. Watching uh, Cygnus sink into the northwestern horizon. Again, this is an artist's depiction of it. And watching Orion fall into the western horizon uh, with the ritual taking place, again, an artist's depiction. Uh, the hand sinks directly into the western horizon, and the soul released in the ceremony makes a leap of faith. It goes to Orion's nebula just before dawn, and then when the sun comes up, Orion makes a journey under the earth, and that is the underworld. That is the soul's journey through the underworld. It emerges the next night on the eastern horizon safely. The soul then would come out of the Ogi and get on to the Milky Way, which was a path, and start heading north. On the way north, it had many tasks and tests. It reached a raptor bird serving as a judge when it reached a split in the Milky Way, which is where the Cygnus constellation was. The soul, if it passed the test, reached the star Deneb, which was the North Pole star at one time. Deneb is also an ogi. The soul would go through that ogi and through a portal into the other world, which itself could serve 
as another very interesting book, but we won't go there. The first place that I wanted to look at and test was Portsmouth, Ohio, that I've already shown you a bit of. This is a uh, survey of Portsmouth. Uh, to calculate all of this, I use Starry Night Pro, which is a, a very good stellar program. Uh, it goes back in time, shows you the rising and setting and movements of various stars. You also have to have the precise GPS of all these locations. And you need to know the azimuth and altitude and so on. Uh, and I actually used online azimuth and altitude calculators. So the main site of Portsmouth, remember I talked about the horseshoe. It's up here, dead center. It's in uh, an elevated area five miles to the uh, southeast. Uh, there are these lines of embankments and an earth, earthen earthwork, which we'll look at in a minute. If you go the other direction, another set of what they call ancient lines, it's a pathway, goes all the way to the Ohio River and goes to what are, is called the Old Fourth Fort Earthworks. This is that artist's depiction Again, this is uh, this comes from the uh, uh, illustration on the mural flood wall uh, at Portsmouth, and you can see the walkway. So I want to show you the horseshoe. That is the only one that is remaining. The other one was under this schoolhouse over here. The walls of this are 10 feet high. We did a uh, ritualistic ceremony in that several years ago with around 20 people. Um, and we had to get permission from the Cherokee tribe to do it. Uh, very interesting is all I can say. In any event, this is the view from the, the other side of the Ohio River in Kentucky to this circular earthwork looking up. And now you can see these mountains in the background. That's why your azimuth and altitude calculator are important. This is the square earth. Uh, earthworks that is seven miles the other direction. Uh, it's a 15 acre square. The walls are 12 feet high. The square still exists today. The rest is pretty much destroyed except for the circle here. And there are three mounds, burial mounds at this entrance that are still here. These walls are 2,100 feet long and they come to a point. My wife called this an eyedropper and there is a house built right at the point of the eyedropper. Uh, I will say we had a very interesting discussion with the people that lived there uh, about strange goings on, can't get to it. When we did the calculations, this is what we came up with. Uh, you see the setting of the winter solstice sun from the center point up here, directly down and across the square earthworks following this gray line, you see the winter solstice sunset. You then from the same spot will see the first rising of Orion behind a mountain in this direction to the southeast. And then you see the setting of Cygnus really from the embankment or the center of this area directly over the horseshoe and the mountain. And the last thing you see is the setting of Orion at 2.45 a.m. And I believe this whole site was a path of souls site, uh, rituals to send the souls to the stars. Another site that's very important, I'll spend about five more minutes on these and then I'll be done. Uh, Moundville, Alabama. This is a schematic map of Moundville. Large central mound here in the center, dead center of it. 20 mounds around it. It's a very flat area. Uh, I will add this. We know that the Native American mound builders did not allow trees to grow in these immediate areas. Uh, they wanted it totally wide open and they also burn off all the grass. So this is the topographical mound of Moundville. Very big site, very impressive site. This is an Air Force photo of it from 1950. This central mound, um, 
we believe all of the Path of Souls alignments were made from. The tallest mound is this one up dead center at the top, 62 feet in height. It's the Chief's Mound. The central mound is probably the Shaman's Mound. But you can see the possible ways here that you can do mound alignments. This is what it looks like uh, from the Chief's Mound. This is the large central mound. And again, gives you a good idea of how you can see from one mound across another. These are the alignments we came up with from this central shaman's mound. First thing you wanna see is the sunset and the sunset on the winter solstice is directly from this point in the mound across a mound right out here. Sunsets at 645. Then you see Orion rising at 715 from the same spot directly across this mound. You would see Cygnus setting or Deneb setting at 1103 p.m. from the same spot on the Shaman's Mound across the second tallest mound. And last, the setting of Orion or Orion falling on the western horizon, 543 a.m. across this mound back one. Uh, good, uh, good overall view of it all, but let's look here. From that mound, these shots are taken from the edge of the central shaman's mound. Here is where you would see the winter solstice sunset across this mound. You would see Orion setting directly across this mound. You see Orion first seen in the morning across this mound. That is Andrew in front of the museum at Moundville. It's a very impressive museum. And I want to say the museum's main theme is the path of souls. It is now totally accepted that Orion and Cygnus and the constellation of Scorpius that you see is what Andrew is standing on here. Scorpius are all involved in it. Scorpius uh, is an element in the sky that couldn't be in the sky during the path of souls because Scorpius was the ruler of the underworld. Uh, at the very top of this museum, uh, you see this, uh, the skull and the bone that re represents one of the souls of the dead. And then this artifact above Andrew has a hand with an ogee in it, the split in the Milky Way and, and Cygnus and Deneb above it. So it's very well accepted. Show you just a couple more and we'll be at the end. Angel Mounds in Indiana. Again, it's all there. The rising and setting of Orion, the setting of Cygnus and the winter solstice sunset. Here is what the central platform looks like. And this is where the alignments were made from. This is one in Louisiana called Fitzhugh Mound. Uh, the thing I really like here, the thing that's really impressive is that there is an elevated walkway here that goes for about 2,000 feet. Uh, it's like a huge linear mound that is real narrow, but it's elevated. And it is directly aligned to the setting of Orion on the horizon at the winter solstice. A couple more. These are Hopewell sites. This one is in Ohio called the Hamilton Earthwork. Again, it's all here. The people would enter this opening. They would see the setting of the sun and they would then watch Orion rise. They would see Cygnus and Deneb set from this specific spot over a burial mound through earthworks that I can't describe. I don't even know how to describe that. Uh, and then the last thing they would see the setting of Orion across this giant burial mound from this corner. And I believe they lit bonfires here. There are also bonfire burial mounds on the outside. I believe there's one more to show you how archeologists worked on some of these sites before we looked at them. This is from 1992. This is called the Fudge Site, it's in Indiana. And in 1992, they worked out that, well, the winter solstice sunrise and sunset and summer solstice sunrise and sunset is there. So in 2016, we looked at it using these uh, computer programs and it's all there. Uh, the arising of Orion is seen from the central mound through the opening. The setting of Deneb is seen from the central mound through the corner and the setting of Orion is here. 
I don't really have time for that site, but let's talk about Winterville a minute. I did mention it. There's a good depiction of Winterville. And here are the alignments from Winterville. They're all there. So summary, the mound builder culture is organized, very, very spiritual. They charted the moon's movements. They charted the solstices, the equinoxes and so on. Uh, they were designed to create sight lines to these astronomical uh, events. They incorporated Orion's nebula, Cygnus, rising and setting of the sun. The summer solstice is, already, is also there. The Massam ceremony of the Cheyenne is there. That is described in the new book that's coming out in March that Andrew and I did called um, Origins of the Gods. They believe that rock was solidified spiritual energy, that water was flowing spiritual energy, dirt is primordial spiritual energy, and all of those elements were arranged in ways to facilitate rituals. They used crystals and other types of rocks. Crystals are really solidified, pure, pure spiritual energy, and the, the way they conducted those rituals is very interesting. We know a lot about what was done, but that basically is pretty much all that I really need to discuss here. And I'm going to turn it back over to Hugh. I know Andrew comes up shortly. And if we have time to do a little more, we will. But that ends it. It's been a pleasure, folks, and I'll probably see you all a bit later. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Greg. I really appreciate that. Um, okay. That was amazing. I mean, I do recommend Greg's giant book on mounds. That is what I used when I went around the mound sites. It is extremely useful. Um, and uh, are you really making an even bigger one? Is that is that the truth? Uh, I am, uh, assuming I live long enough. Uh, <laughs> it took uh, seven years from the first edition of it to the more recent one. But yes, I, I want to make it, uh, I want to try and get it pretty much uh, con I, I, comprehensive. I want to cover them all. Uh, there's only 3,000 sites covered in that book. It's like 3,000 sites are named or covered. And there's probably 10,000 that I need to do. And I have lots more illustrations, lots of photos. It is, a, it is an illustrated encyclopedia that's the key and uh, people like to see the pictures and so in it i want to make it clear it doesn't have real detailed explanations of everything in it but what it has is an introduction to the site basically what's there when it was built and so on and a bit of what we know about them but yes i am working on another one uh, this is from uh margaret again i've just finished a book about how the main pyramid in egypt was where they trained initiates to take the path of souls after their death but in this case they ended up as serious i wonder if you have any comments on that well, yeah, first of all, I do, I would agree that the pyramid was a place where they trained initiates and it had to do with death and afterlife, obviously. Uh, I don't know about the serious thing. I know that uh, even Graham Hancock now believes that the Egyptian journey to the sky probably started with um, Orion. And I know he now believes that the Milky Way is involved. And he's accepted that uh, in, in the Americas, anyway, North, Central, and South America, uh, there was a journey then that went on to Cygnus, or probably Deneb, which was seen as this giant bird. And I know Andrew will get into that. Uh, but I don't, I don't know about Egypt. I can say that uh, from everything I've read, I think Egyptian beliefs are identical to the Native American beliefs. And I know everybody thinks the Egyptian beliefs are the oldest, um, I, I just think they're the most um, obvious and they're in very big buildings and structures that everybody's impressed with. People don't seem to be that impressed with American mounds, uh, but American mounds are incredible. Those geometric earthworks are incredible. And in South America and Central America, the pyramids, the ancient structures beat anything anywhere else in the world. Uh, and it's just hard to get to sometimes. So I don't know about Sirius. Sirius does show up in some mound alignments here in the United States. So that's my answer. I don't know about Egypt and Sirius. I'm sure it was important. 
Um, I've actually got a question because um, in, in Britain, like in some places, we have like um, some mounds, even some, some stone circles, I believe, like um, up in Orkney, they actually kind of carve almost like a henge out of solid rock, out of bedrock. Have you come across that with any mound culture sites? I can't think of any where they where they carved the, you'd call it a hinge, then you call them barrows. I can't think, we'd call it a moat. Uh, I can't. I can't think of any of the moats that were carved out of stone at any sites. I've been to a lot of sites in the United States, and I, I don't know of any moats that were carved out of rock. And that includes even in the Southwest. Uh, there are similar sites in the Southwest, but and there's drainage areas that were carved out of rock. But I don't. I, I can't think of any moats that were like uh, that were these geometric earthworks made of rock. No. They did use rock for a lot of things, though. I've got a couple of comments. I'll just read these out. This is from Stephen. Um, Stephen Pickstock. Round earthworks for sites are so interesting as the first churches uh, were earthworks, too. There was one in Wales near Pencoed next to a church, and often they were built on them as well. Um, and also, Vicky Tate says, where I live there is an 11th century church based on the site of an ancient well connected with the same document and mm -hmm. so forth. And yeah, so just a few comments. We haven't got any more questions right now. Uh, I think let people me, say let them. me mention this yeah. thing about the circular earthworks and so on. I didn't have time to get in all that. It's, it's so complicated and we know so much, we know more than we can actually say because we don't have time to say it all or, or write it all. But uh, the, I showed a close, I made a big deal about a closed circular earthwork and other circular earthworks would have like one opening. So you see a lot of them with one opening, but there are some that are closed. And so it, why, why do you suppose that? So here's what I can tell you about one bit of it. They were manifesting or evoking spiritual forces inside those earthworks. And those walls of earth, if it's closed, it contains whatever it is that they are invoking and manifesting there. That's the way it is. They were enclosing it. When they had an opening, it was inviting something in, and the opening was often oriented toward some important mountain or cave or structure to bring in some spiritual entity or spiritual force. But the walls of earth were used to enclose the spiritual entities. The idea is, is that a spiritual entity has to travel along the surface. The wall of earth is the most primordial form of spirit that exists. And these, these spiritual entities can only travel in straight lines. That's the idea. Real simple. That's uh, yeah, that's, that's like the spirit paths of Britain as well. You get all yeah. this kind of stuff. And so Andy Williams asks, is there much official interest in these amazing sites oh, from yeah. regular museums or are they generally ignored? Oh, there's museums all over uh, at mound sites in the United States. There's probably about 50. I, can't, I don't know offhand. Uh, I would say there's 50 museums at mound sites that are either national monuments or national parks or state parks or local parks. So, yeah, uh, the, the one at Moundville, Alabama, the, the museum there is predominantly about the path of souls because that's where it was all really totally verified at was at Moundville, Alabama. But there is a lot of interest. The problem is they can't excavate at them anymore <laughs> because of the laws. They just can't do it. So it's archaeology and digging into mounds has come to a complete standstill. And that standstill began in the 1990s. Maeve Calver asks, how does the path of souls fit in with Freddie Silver's A Living Resurrection, where people undertook a type of shamanic journey through the Dua underworld while still alive and then became resurrected while still in the human body? You know I hope this? you know the answer to that because I have no idea whatsoever how to answer that. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Say, I, I have no idea. I'm okay. honest. When I don't know something, I just I don't know. I'm I'm familiar with Silva and some of his ideas, but that particular one, I don't know. And I see this earth light UFO activity, UAP activity. Absolutely. That is what got me into mounds to begin with. Long involved thing there, but yes, there's been a lot of that associated with mound sites. 
Yeah, for those that didn't see that, there's a, a question about earth lights and activity with the mounds. But can you expand on that a little bit, please? I mean, may, maybe you don't want to share your personal experiences, but... Well, my per- uh, yeah. the first mounds we went to uh, and took pictures, I decided it was in ni- roughly 1984, early 1984, when I decided to do this mound encyclopedia. And the second site that we ever visited was called Pinson Mounds near Memphis. It's about, about 90 miles from Memphis. Uh, and there's some gigantic mounds. I showed you some photos of them in this presentation. And I took photos. And when I got home, they were black and white back in the days when all we had was film. So I had the film developed. And there were these globs of objects in the sky over the largest mound there. And it's almost like it was a... My initial interest was UFOs. I had no idea when I got into mounds that it was going to link to UFOs. I had no idea, but there were these globs. And then I started doing more research and reading story after story after story of people saying that they saw lights come out of the mounds, that they saw beings sometimes, luminous beings come out of the mounds. And there are several Native American legends that that had hundreds and hundreds of witnesses of beings, translucent light beings coming out of the mounds. Usually it was done to defend the people who lived there. That's when these events occurred. But there are a bunch of accounts like that. Good enough? Yes. That's good enough for me. (laughs) All right. But so so that relates to kind of really kind of like the fairy law of kind of Britain. I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, do you have little people? Yeah. I mean, are there there similar traditions? No, absolutely. The little people. uh, A lot of these stories are going to be about the little people that are very similar to the fairies, the Muslim jinn. They're real similar to that. The little people. Uh, I tell a story of a Cheyenne arrow priest, a shaman who stayed at our house for 30 days. And that was in the eighties. And I had a device in an office. I was then in a private practice with a psychiatrist and psychologist. And there was this device that you laid on and it put an electromagnetic bubble around your body. And this electromagnetic bubble was tuned at the Schumann resident resonance the ambient electromagnetic frequency of the earth. It also made this circular rotation. You'd lay down on it and then it would rotate every seven seconds. And that is tuned to the average uh, cycle of ocean waves. So depending on which way you lay in this thing, you'd have a North and a South pole. Well, I took the shaman, let him lay in that thing. And he came in later and he told me about his experience in there. It it, it actually frightened him of seeing the little people. And he called them little blue people. They started appearing in the room. And I was in another room. I was doing insurance paperwork on a Sunday. And I brought him over there just so he could see the thing. Uh, That is one example. There are loads of others in the literature. I tell that whole story in that new book. Uh, Again, it won't be out for months. It's the end of March when it comes out. But there are lots of those kind of stories that are in the literature. The little people is found, the stories of the little people are found in every Native American tribals, tribal lore that exists. All of them have those stories. Mickey Tay asks, what do you think of the theory that stories of fairies, goblins, etc. might be references to other species of human that are now extinct? Uh, No, I don't believe that. Okay. Personally, okay. I don't. I think there are there are definitely were extinct species. It's pop. It's possible, like Bigfoot or Sasquatch is, is that. But I don't think they are. I think there's something else. I'm not saying they don't exist, and I'm not saying they're completely mental or they're hallucinations. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I don't think that they were earlier species. I think there's something else that they are real. They really do exist, but they are ephemeral. Uh, they are made of subtle energy. And that subtle energy interacts with us mentally in a way uh, it gets kind of complicated. But no, I don't think they're beings in the sense that we are. They are physically real when they manifest. They're not physically real when they demanifest or disintegrate themselves. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's interesting because uh, when Jim and I were researching Giants on Record, we came across some 
um, explorers' accounts from the 15 and 1600s, where they basically talk about there were along the road, you know, the sides of the river, the banks of the river, there were tribes of giants and pygmies. Oh, I'm not saying that yeah, you didn't say giants. Yeah. The giants were, I think they were physically real. You you asked earlier about the, the little people, fairies, elves, and all that. Yeah. I think that's the ephemeral stuff. But no, the giants were real. There's there's clear evidence. There were there was a race of what was called giants. These are people that probably average somewhere between seven to eight feet in height. There were probably some a lot taller. And of course, they had some smaller, but they, they did exist. There's no doubt about that. Mainstream archaeology doesn't accept it, of course, because uh, it... it They've gone for so many years saying it didn't exist uh, that it's it's hard for them now to admit it. People have real trouble admitting that what they've said for 30 or 40 years is wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, we do. That's mainstream psychology stuff. And it's very difficult to admit everything I've believed is wrong. That is awful hard for people to, to admit. Carrie has a final question here. Did, she asked, did you see the translucent beings coming out of mounds being associated with a ritual such as a Native American ghost dance or just spontaneously coming up from the mound? Uh, with that, I can't see the question, but was she asking me if I saw it? Um, yes, but have you heard no, of it as I well? Didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see that. Those are historical accounts uh, of large numbers of what looked like native translucent native American warriors coming out of mounds. There's a story of one of those in North Carolina at a very famous mound in Franklin, North Carolina, and also at the, uh, a Choctaw mound in Mississippi, two stories of that. And they're both very, lots of witnesses to them. Uh, my own experiences are just me and other people. I can't say I've ever, I have not seen a translucent being, come out of a mound. I have seen what looked like a real Native American come out of a mound, but not a translucent being. This It, it seemed real, but it was during a ritual and I'm sure some of it was uh, um, mental. I just saw somebody popped up a thing about the ghost dance and people saying beings. Yes, there are accounts of that. Uh, if you're really interested in that ghost dance stuff, you you need to read about uh, Wavoka and the real story of Wavoka and what went on. Wavoka is the guy that started the ghost dance. Uh, there are lots of stories about it. Watch the movie Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Excellent movie. And it does show Wavoka in it, but you don't see the whole story. Wavoka is not what people think Wavoka was. That's my answer to that. But it's great. Yes, people have seen weird stuff happen during ghost dances. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for your time. Hey, thank, thank, thank you. For you. The, I'll be uh, back later when uh, we all gather together. Mm -hmm.